Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's the 25th of April, and we have a show where we are pulling together our thoughts about NetSmart because Howard Rheingold is going to be joining us next week, and we want to, to kind of talk about the book ahead of time and see what's going on. What we've done is we've grabbed some images from the book and even some text. And we have four people with us, or three people with us tonight. I guess I'm the fourth, and maybe others will join us. We'll see. Um, Sarah Roll is with us again. You were with us a couple of weeks ago when we started talking about the book. Um, Fred Midland is with us. Am I saying your name right, Fred? It's you sort of are burying the end. It's Mindelin. But. Mindelin. That's a much prettier yeah. way of saying it. And Mara Nava <laughs> has rejoined us, I think. Mara, yeah. it's uh, 3 o'clock in France. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So welcome. Mara, you're, you're furthest away, so introduce yourself first and uh, tell us... Uh, some of your interest in digital literacies. And let's just kick us off that way. Um, well, I teach uh, uh, engineering students, uh, multimedia students, for the most part. And uh, one of my courses I do is um, teaching English for the web. So I'm quite interested in hmm. um, learning about digital literacy to help my students mm -hmm. basically that's valerie burton uh, joining us welcome valerie okay hi valerie hello hi you can't hear yet okay she'll work on it we're getting lots of static from you Oh, you can't hear me. What? That's funny. <laughs> I, I can hear the static, yeah. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, I think it's. Oh, Valerie will work it out. I, yeah, I think Great she's aware. Her. Okay. Cool. So, Sarah, introduce yourself again. And Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Raleigh. I'm the technology director at a small independent school, the Elizabeth Morrow School in northern New Jersey. I also teach computers to kindergarten, first, and second grade. Um, and we have a real push for digital literacies in our school as well. So this is um, a really big interest to me, especially with uh, middle school students. Cool. Uh, Va Valerie still no sound, it looks like. But Fred, introduce yourself, please. My name is Fred Mendlin, and I'm the Associate Director for Technology Integration with our local writing project in Santa Cruz County, the Central California Writing Project. And I present uh, digital literacy trainings on uh, various topics, some of which will come up in this uh, discussion, actually. Um, and I also uh, work on projects in local schools in Santa Cruz County. And Fred, in a couple of weeks, you're going to do a string uh, string games show for us. Is that right? Yeah, I, I'm very excited about it. It's been a great motivator. Um, I, I thank you, Paul, actually, for really encouraging me to get started on putting together this curriculum that I've I've been using but never actually written down um, because it, it and it, it relates to this topic in the sense that um, it, finding ways to introduce games and play and fun into public schools again is, is so important and and helps digital literacy even though it's there's nothing digital about it except that digital also means something you do with your fingers so i i love that uh that synchronicity of meaning in the uh in the term but we'll, we'll go into that in a couple of weeks okay uh monica hardy is with us and what 
Sorry, Fred, did you start to say something? No. Uh, no, I was just going to say, by string games, I mean Cat's Cradle, like the two-person game where you go back and forth and there are thousands of individual string games, just to make that clear. Cool. Hi, Monica. So, hey, guys. Sorry I'm late. Oh, thank you for coming. Um, and Valerie, can you hear us yet? I guess not. <laughs> We're working on that. Um, Fred, why don't you start by telling us about your connections with Howard Rheingold? Well, I, I uh, did not actually know Howard except by name when we were both students at Reed College in the early 1960s, but I've been aware of that connection and followed his writing and uh, a lot of his work. And then I reconnected with him about a year ago when uh, I was invited to participate in one of his Mind Amplifiers online courses. And that was a very interesting and exciting process. And then I got to see him for the first time in the flesh since the early 60s at the Digital Media and Learning Conference in San Francisco, where Monica and Paul and I all met also. So that was that was wonderful to see Howard again. He's he's a, a character. Yeah, like and, few others. And one of the things I love about the book is that his history, his personality is there. Um, so that's that's one of the keys to the book in some way, I think. Mm. But, yeah. Um, Maura, tell us your interests yes. in the book, in Howard Rheingold, just in general, just to introduce yourself a little bit more. Um, yes, I think I mentioned I uh, read his virtual reality some years ago. Um, and that book always struck me. Um, uh, Mm -hmm. I guess I remember the first chapter started off describing the Lascaux caves in France um, and how that was an example of the first example of uh, virtual reality um, implementation, I guess, of the paintings and the initiates being dragged into a, a darkened cave with these flickering images. So that, that chapter uh, uh, really got hold of me. As for his new book, I've not actually read it, but I'm looking forward to getting a copy soon. Um, mm -hmm. And basically, my interests uh, are probably going be going off to bed in about uh, 20 minutes. But that's a good thing. Uh, good thing. While I'm here, I, I'm hoping just to, I'm just uh, hoping to get some idea of the book because um, I assume you some guys here have already read it. So I'm interested in just seeing. Um, your initial impressions of what you've read so far. Monica, take it. <laughs> what? Okay, well, my I'm kind of a latecomer, as in tonight, but also as in coming on the web. And um started for me about four years ago on one of my very first podcasts, um, which I didn't even know what it was at the time, but I happened on to kind of a fireside chat that Her Howard and Alec Kroos and Dean Shersky were having. And it made a huge impression on me because it was about, Howard kept saying, well, they all did, but that the gatherings that we have matter. Who's together in a room matters. You know, and so that kind of fed all of our research the last four years. Um, Steve Hargadon snuck me into a dinner with him at my first ISTE a couple years ago. Um, then I did get to see him again at um, the Digital Media and Learning Conference. Um, the first book of his that I read, um, I'd read some of his stuff, but the first book was NetSmart. And the thing that I absolutely love about NetSmart um, is when he talks about the, net, the networked individualism. Again, another big piece of our research is um, that's that's really the difference that now you, the person is the node. You know, the person 
gets to pick and choose instead of instead of us telling a person what to do. Um, you really get to build your own network around that. So the networked individualism to me was huge. Um, he's got a lot of wisdom in the book. The history part was very interesting. Um, I didn't realize that you were part of that, Fred. But um, so I really liked that book, and that led me to go back then and read Smart Moths, which was brilliant as well. Valerie, can you introduce yourself yet? <laughs> Sorry. Good. Um, hi, Good. Valerie Burton, English teacher Perfect. from New Orleans. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. You're okay. Perfect. Yeah, we hear you fine. Yeah. Okay, I had to reset my, my stuff. Valerie, keep talking. What's your first impressions of the book? And then we'll get into some detail. Um. Oh, no. She was here for a brief moment. I was going to say she looks frozen. <laughs> I'm gone. Oh. No, no, you're back. Go ahead. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> okay. The, um, I liked the syllabus. And the syllab the book for me is like resources and reference material for the syllabus. And I say the syllabus because I'm trying to find a way to fold in the networking, the social media, everything um, into my English classroom. So I'm loving the book. I'm loving the syllabus. And I'm playing around with it to make it fit my class and what we do on a regular basis. So he's speaking well, what I'm thinking. Right. Well, one of the things that I've thought about the syllabus, and, and that's you're referring to the document that he compiled from his his college syllabus. That, and he's right. asking us to think about, you know, what it might look like in a high school situation. Um, and I think there are lots of questions about that. But one of the things I think... Well, one of the reviews that I've read of the book suggests that Howard is um, sort of outlining, outlining a new discipline. So a big question that I have in this is, is there room in the high school curriculum for a new discipline? Do we need a new discipline? We talked a couple of weeks ago about maybe a school taking this on in different pieces. But I just wanted to ask, like, how much of what's in that syllabus do you think is in an English curriculum? You're an English teacher, right, Valerie? Did you hear that question? Yeah. Right. See, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm um, a lot of the, the crap detection and um, stuff like that can go into our research component. Mm -hmm. And that is part of what they need to do in our English class is research. So some of that can be folded into that area. Um, I want them to be able to investigate and reflect and show engagement by participating. Well, that angle can be folded into everything we do to the point that now I'm trying to come up with some hashtags and I'm going to have a recorder, three recorders every week. And they're going to have to tweet out relevant vocabulary words and reflection questions and conclusions that they come up with and stuff like that. And the kids are going to have to be required to form and complete an ebook. So, I mean, there are certain angles that can be folded in to each of the units, each of the units that, you know, I do on a regular basis. So I don't see it as being a separate discipline. I see it as taking pieces of it and folding it into what I already do. And kind of along those lines, um, you know, we're kind of pushing the compulsory curriculum. I mean, that's what we're trying to get rid of. Um, so as a coming in between way, the way we would see it is, um, what if that is mostly the curriculum? And then all the other the disciplines are um, per choice. Um, now speaking specifically in regard to Howard's piece on attention. I mean, if we all learned how to pay attention better and to be mindful, um, that would take care of everything else, really. Um, so my thought, coming from my extreme, you know, 
um, maybe not extreme, but I don't know what you call it. Mm -hmm. What do you call it? Crazy? <laughs> well, from that yeah. angle, I'm looking at it more as, you know, what if this was more of a curriculum, talking to kids about mindfulness and how you pay attention to things um, and, um, and how you have that networked individualism so that when you are free to pick and choose, you, you, have, a, you have a smart way to go about it. Mm-hmm. So Aren't you glad I came off? Yeah, I I mean I was gonna ask what you thought. I mean, I actually think it's it's too directive. I mean I don't you know <laughs> so I agree. I agree. Uh, yeah. Well uh, as far as the um so everybody has to do an ebook and yeah. um I honestly I haven't looked real closely at the syllabus that he has. Um I was excited. I love Howard because he totally is a learner. I mean, he yeah. is doing what most of us aren't doing and noticing things and wanting to learn. I mean, he's brilliant. And he will listen to a peon like me, you know, and, and try to learn something. And so um, the fact that he has a syllabus out there and he wants people to tweak it, that's pretty yeah. much why I suggested this to you because um, He's worked on the university level one, but he hasn't worked on the high school level one. So, yeah, saying everybody needs to do an ebook or saying everybody needs to do this specific thing, that's going back to compulsion. So, yeah. Well, I think it also reflects what uh, one of the one of the big reflections that I have had throughout my recent reconnection with Howard is how much his approach to all of these topics is shaped by his experience as an educator of adults essentially mm -hmm. that's what mm -hmm. his education work has been is all with adults and for me the really challenging question is how do we take some of these ideas and push them into a way to really reconstruct the entire approach to especially primary and elementary education which has been my experience so that students become the center of learning again just as the person is the center of learning in um, the, the, the digital literacy approach that, that Howard is advocating for adults, but in fact, the, the tendency of um, established curriculum throughout K-12 education in in the U.S. pretty much, again with some exceptions at the at the secondary level, but for primary especially, and it's all directive, it's all it's all mandated. The 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 um, the student is still, even despite all the blah blahsing about um, changes, it's still in effect almost all the time the student as vessel receiving something from the adult world. And there's no, there's, there's very little except in the occasional rebellious outposts and the individual rebellious teachers who don't do what they're supposed to once the door is closed, if they're not too worried about somebody walking in, to actually give agency to students. That's, mm -hmm. and, and I was going to ask Sarah about her work. She said she teaches um, computers to K3. <laughs> and so I, I wanted to ask her reflection on that point. That is, for me, the crucial question about any um, use of computers in school is who's telling the computer what to do? Is the computer being used as essentially a curriculum delivery mechanism where the student is getting the gospel from the computer and being told they're right or wrong? That's the the computer telling the student what to do. And especially in the primary um, in the primary grades, there's virtually no agency for students. They they 
they don't get any time to write on the computer, even at the bare minimum, much less create their own audio and multimedia documents with these relatively rare exceptions. I think that really varies school to school. Um, I, I think we are seeing in this day and age much more um, creativity that technology offers. Um, there are some uses of computers where I am that I um, don't think are the best choice and generally speaking it means that people aren't discussing it with me but for the most part where I am um, computers are used as tools um, and that could be anything from um, creating uh, a journey in Google Earth um, that we then hopefully share with other people to um, I, right now I'm coordinating for the month of May a connection between my second grade classes and second grade classes in other countries because our second grade um, the the end piece of the year in their social studies is culture um, and a couple of years ago I said to them you know I, I think we really need to connect with a school somewhere else it's great that your kids study their own heritage but let's let's hear from some kids in another country um, and that's evolved over time. Um, but, you know, we also use um, 3D virtual environments so that our kids can go in and build and, and orchestrate things. Um, and one of the things we've learned over the last few years, and I know that this is somewhat of a rarity, is that if you can let your kids go and give them the opportunity to do, to some extent, what they want, even if you're giving them a broad assignment, they show you amazing things. Mara, but, did did you have any questions for us? Bef I wanted it's three o'clock where you are, so I wanted to <laughs> check in with you. Uh, yeah, I'm just about to sign off. Um, well, my first thought was uh, for those who've read the book, um, I I know uh, uh, Howard Rangel, um previous book. I've only read one book, is well very well referenced. So I was just wondering how well referenced uh, his latest book is and that's basically the first thought a uh, question I had the honest. last third the last third of the book is all footnotes and references so it's it's good <laughs> from that perspective okay. Okay. but why why is that important um, I was wondering you know, it's just my personal um, bias with uh, reading books. Um, I'm, I'm always interested in getting, getting to sources, so and I always, you know, value a writer who who um, references very well. So um, that mm -hmm. just basing my experience on reading his virtual reality book, which is very well referenced, and led me to onto other things. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about that. Are, are you familiar with Howard's um, uh, Mora? Are you? Familiar with Howard's Mind Amplifiers course? I'm not. No, I'm not. If you if you just uh, Google that, uh, he's he's offering it continuously, uh -huh. and and a lot of the materials are available without even enrolling in the course. So um, that's another way to access okay. a lot of his work. Okay. Thank you. I'll I'll, I'll look that up. Hey, um, Paul, can we throw in this link to that slide deck? Huh? What link? Yeah, we can. We'll we, we'll do that. Sure. Okay. For, also, for uh, I guess just just to interject. Sorry. Um. I, I, I'm. Um. Uh. What Valerie said earlier about uh, crap detection and research. I'm quite interested in that angle because a lot of my students um, are doing project work uh, based on research on the net. So, um, if uh, if I if I had to pose a question to Howard Reingold, I would ask him about his to expand a bit more on, uh, I mean, on that point. Not having read the book, so I guess he would you would tell me to read the book. But if I had um, <laughs> if I had to give, give him a question, actually, he's done uh, he's done so much on crap detection that you could just Google him with crap detection. 
and get you know, right, okay. I see. some of the stuff that he's done with that. But what do you All think right, the okay. what do you think the problem is for your students around that issue? The is problem there, is, uh, the, yeah, there's a number of things. I guess the main one is that they're quite lazy and they just want to follow the first results right. that they get from their searches. And, right. Um, and I hope he went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it was great he joined us for France. But anyway. So, but we, um, but thank you for coming. Vinny Brutney, welcome. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well, thank you. Yourself tonight? Good. Have you been reading the book more, or what are your thoughts generally about the book? Well, I'm, I think that I've now finished the book, but I've, you know, jumped around as needed, need be, so. Mm hmm I think it's a it's a it's a real good book. I mean, I, it's um, I, sitting on the ISTE uh, Independent School Special Interest Group um, Executive Board. It was one of the books that we did uh, consider for our summer read, mm -hmm. but we ended up going with Kathy Kathy Davidson's instead. So, okay. Mara, do you want to continue? You were. Uh, Students, I, yep, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so the question, yeah, um, the first one, yeah, they're quite lazy. The second one, yeah, they just seem to accept very naturally anything that's presented to them digitally without trying to question them. I don't know why. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas, yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess those so, are the two main things. Um, and I, I would just come back on to say good night. In fact, so, <laughs> uh, my uh, my, atten Thank my you. attention is sort of slowly draining at the moment, and I can't keep up <laughs> with the conversation. Um, Thanks so, so I, much. I wish you uh, uh, long continuation on your conversation. Um, so, and maybe I might be able to catch your next. Uh, I think you're going to have Iron Hal Rangel next week. So I'm that's maybe correct. Catch you so. Next week. If you're up, join us. Take a nap first. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Thank good night. Good night. Or good morning. Good night. <laughs> so, shall we try to pull this um, presentation up and and look at it together? Does that sound like a plan? Sure. Um, and and we can add some and go with questions. So here's what you need to do. You need to, on your, well, actually, Sarah, can you explain how to do this? Because <laughs> you yes. got it right. And then in I'll the go upper, and do it myself. Yep, in the upper left-hand corner, if you click on apps and add docs, um, I can't, I don't think I can redo it because I'm already looking at it. But, but if, I look, if, if I go to the bottom under people at the bottom left, I can alternate between people and apps. Right. But do you, if you go to apps at the bottom, do you have docs showing? Yes. Okay, because I had to go to apps at the top and add docs. I didn't have it automatically. And then I got um, in the center a link because Paul had shared right. NetSmart. You all seem to be here. It's, uh, it's pretty good. And uh, is that true that you're all here? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Can everyone see it? Uh, yeah. I thought you meant, are we here? Yeah, we're here. <laughs> we're, we're here. No, I, <laughs> mine, came, mine came right up. Excellent instructions. Okay. Yeah. I know. That's why I thought she should do it. Okay. So, do you see? I just wrote write notes here. Can everybody nice. do that? Nice. There's, yeah. Okay. That's kind of cool. <laughs> well, how do I copy the comments I already put? I already did it. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's how. 
I, I think the only thing we have to do is share what slide we're looking at because everybody controls them individually. That's true. So let's start on the first slide or the second slide. Okay. I want to go oh, down okay. there. Okay. Oop, I'm getting an echo. Somebody have something on? <laughs> or did your earphones come out? Okay. Still here. So who would like to go to some something on here? I mean, maybe we could just describe. Let's skip the first two. Let's go down to the fourth one, which is attention, right? Mm -hmm. And so, does that sound like a plan? Okay. Let me go. Okay. So, Valerie, start us off. Read us what you wrote there. Okay, so I thought this was really funny. I assumed everybody was on their pad as they, you know, browse and walk down the street not paying attention. So, a little message just said, okay, well, I'm not about to walk into traffic looking at my tablet. I do frequently read emails in the bathroom while my daughter takes a bath or I move my boyfriend from his comfy spot to get to my phone to read a tweet. And I, I, just, I thought I lost my cell phone the other day and I was in an absolute panic. So I, I can definitely understand the attention that we focus on our individual machines. And you know right. we're oblivious to everything else and we're focused blindly on the technology. So I can see myself in this picture kinda, mm -hmm. sorry to say. It's a little embarrassing, but I do. It's cool. But I, I think um, when I think about reading the chapter on attention, I think that's part of it. But I think the other part is even when technology is a necessity, choosing. Um, it was very interesting for me to read. That's Fred. Fred's on the phone. Yep. Okay. <laughs> It, it was really interesting for me to read ha Howard describing his setup with multiple screens and I thought you know I almost wish that my only distractions were digital you know when he was talking about well I see on the left hand side an email and I choose not to to attend to that because I'm trying to write but I attend to the tweet that I think might be pertinent to my writing and I thought but my desk at work is on the side of a computer lab with my tech teacher's desk and my tech technologist guy, support guy's desk. And I think the three of us are very careful to say, do you have a minute right now? That kind of thing, not to just outright distract. But, you know, but I'm interrupted all the time because our computer lab, our, our building is an old mansion and the computer lab is a pass through to get from one side to the other. So people see us and they go, oh, I need something. And so, and even if it's not pertinent, I mean, the other morning I'm writing an email and I've got it all composed in my head and I'm typing and someone comes over to tell me a story. And it, you know, it was an amusing story, but it was just a story. And when I was done, when he left, I, I had to totally refocus. Yeah. Right. I had no idea anymore what I had planned to write and had to start over. Um, and so, though I appreciate the idea, and it's true for me at other times where I feel like I have to um, say, yes, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm focused on this conversation and I'm looking at the slides and I'm listening to each of you and when the syllabus came up before, I did go and look for a link for the syllabus because when I was reading the book, honestly, I wasn't thinking about the syllabus, even though I had looked at the syllabus before our first conversation. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't really put those two things together in my head. So that was something where I did need to attend to both of those. So I appreciate that decision making. Right. But sometimes I do feel like, to an extent, it's out of my... <laughs> like, oh, I was going to say I can't read the first word. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, you know, where I could, can't, you know, I, where I don't have control. And what do you do then? 
Well, in the BU house, we had that problem this year, and we made these signs that we could wear, That's so that great. because people aren't people aren't mean, they just aren't thinking that you might be busy at work, you know. Yeah. And so that was one experiment that we did, and um, it was very interesting, you know, um, to find out that we could take charge of even those moments. Um, Jason Fried comes to mind if you've ever followed him or read his book called Rework and he says work is where you get the least done hmm. for the very reasons that you just said um, and so they are you know making conscious decisions about that and and just opening that conversation up I think um, people realize it's just when they don't know that of course they're gonna something pops in their head and they're gonna say something you know mm -hmm. they don't realize you're doing something it looks like nothing's going on well, that's a great idea I know I'm about to print one out now and see um, the, the part I loved about Howard talking about attention is you know he describes the first day of class and when he has everyone power off and you think He's saying what we're talking about. That you guys, shh, you guys, get rid of everything else. But what he what he's saying is that our minds are all over the place. And so sometimes I've seen it tons with kids. Um, and I, I've learned this about myself that we some of those things we use to help us focus more. You know, like this. You could say this is an, a distraction, but actually it helps me focus more. Um, if you're a mother and you're at some meeting and you're worried about your kid, a text could help you focus more if that got resolved, you know. Mm -hmm. So I love the way that he talks about um, even though it seems like extra stuff, our mind is all over the place. And so it's what we choose to focus on, you know. And if there's things that are, you know, we, we can decide what, what to choose. So. I like that take as well. So let me ask a question that I had. And I like all the references to mindfulness and the, the di different scientific and also other kinds of references. Um, I started to wonder in thinking about my own students if I could assume they're being intentional with their choices, right? I think there's too much assumption in what Howard's presenting here that students are not being intentional with their media choices. So when a kid comes in and he's playing music and he doesn't want to shut it off, is he not paying attention to me? Or is he focusing on what he wants to focus on? Do you know what I'm saying? I... <laughs> yeah, the, the question for me about that is mm -hmm. that it is not as if this is a, uh, a, a media world in which there's this, this vast array from which to choose and kids evaluate a broad range and make those choices. Rather, it's a media environment in which there were very powerful interests with very sophisticated persuasion tools who are working really hard to grab their attention and force that attention in a particular way based on their essentially corporate agendas. And so unless kids are in situations where there are people who are pointing that out to them and giving them opportunities to reflect critically about, and well, how do, how do you tell when, I mean, I remember talking about product placement in movies to a middle school class and getting really ferociously angry, outraged responses from kids who were trying to tell me, no, you're, you, that's, that's not true. They don't do that. And I said, wait a minute, you know, think about it. I, when you're holding a can of soda, do you always make sure that your friend can see the name of the <laughs> brand of soda? But think about when you see a can of soda in a movie, that name is towards the camera. 
you know, it's that's a that's a deliberate, manipulative, purposeful choice on the part of a media creator, and that's why that agency of the 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 student to create themselves is so important. In that's what I see as sort of missing in Howard's whole perspective. It's still all in a way about. And that's that's his that's his brief in this book in particular, so it makes sense. But it's all about being an intelligent consumer, and the question of how do you then use those competencies that you develop about how you consume to become a powerful creator that's missing in the book. Can I can I be a little Please. out there? It's called dialogue. Yeah. Please, right. Monica. Um, so, I, this is out there, and this is nothing against people. You know I love people. <laughs> um, but how many of us have sat through a day, and, and this goes for teachers as well, it goes for anybody anywhere, but I'm just now going to a kid, sat through mm -hmm. the day of a kid, um, and how much propaganda is in that, not intentionally by the teachers because they're told what to do, but are we letting them crap detect our classes, you know, and question them? And in some cases, mm -hmm. um, that some of those distractions are saving them. I mean, mm -hmm. if you do go through the course of a day in some situations and they're being barraged with rationalizing a denominator and then they're going someplace else that the words are something they can't even understand and there's, you know, maybe acting up in the class or something, um, how much of that is we're, we're pointing the pop can to the front and saying you've got to get a grade so you've got to sit here you know so mm -hmm. so the whole idea again of this maybe being more of the curriculum is we've got to call everything into question and why are we even in the room in the first place and maybe maybe we can change up who's in rooms per choice, in spaces per choice, by this networked individualism. And then maybe they will be more intentional choices for what they pay attention to. Because right now, we're not, we're not really giving them choices. You know, we think we are, like with project-based learning and things, but we're still saying, here's this your 10 you choices, have, have a right. choice. You know, so, so anyway, that's just where I go. Tanisha, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Monica. We'll get around. Go ahead. I, I, I'm going to apologize in advance because I know I have not read the book that you guys are discussing. I just know that I was on Google and I saw that I was invited to a hangout and I saw Monica Hardy and I saw Valerie and I was like, I'm in. <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually cool. in the process. I haven't even told me and Valerie in the same city. I haven't even told Valerie yet that I'm actually um, decided to quit my job this year and to start my own school with experiential learning and kids really exploring topics that are of interest to them. I've had a lot of angst this school year because I've been doing a lot of exciting projects with my kids, but at the same time, you, you feel like even though the kids are excited and you know that they're learning, you have difficulty because you know that they have to pass tests and they have to be accountable. There's standards and there's so many things that you have to deal with in the classroom that to me almost impede just learning because kids learn in so many different ways and it seems like the definition of learning from the system is becoming increasingly narrow as time goes on. So um, I, I guess maybe hope that served as an introduction, but I just, I'm very excited wow, yeah. to be a part of this conversation. <laughs> Tell us more about your school. How do you start a school where you are? Where are you? Uh, LOL. <laughs> uh -huh. This is actually what we're in the process of figuring out. We want to start a home school. And, mm -hmm. you know, right now we've been offered some space. We have some um, financial backing. Somebody just basically contacted me recently and told me, you know, what she was interested in doing. And it was very similar to what was important to me. She's also a teacher. And I think a lot of teachers are getting tired of, you know, being told what to do by people who don't have children's best interests at heart 
or even have experience being around children long enough to know that a standardized test does not determine a child's potential or it's not predictive of whether they're going to be successful when they leave school. So I think that's really the basis. I guess before we leave, I can give you our website. We're definitely still in the very early planning stages, but I guess I'm just now at the point where I really feel excited and comfortable about making this transition. So one of the other books that we talked about is Walk Out and Walk On. Sounds like you're in the process <laughs> of doing that. <laughs> so welcome. Um, and, you know, we're going to continue talking about the book next week. So if you can join us again next week, that'd be great. Um, okay. And if you can read the book in between, that'd be great, too. Yeah, I'll um, do my best. So... Teaching kids about attention, I think, is really important. Um, taking taking Howard's curriculum and even the way he talks about it in the book, and moving that into my own context, I want to. I found myself sitting down beside a student and saying, "You're listening to this song and singing this song." You're also at the same time trying to read this short story on, you know, on the screen that and responding to it. Um, you know, according to this book I just read, <laughs> switching back and forth between these two things isn't very efficient, right? But can I assume that that kid wants to read the short story? You know, I don't think I can. <laughs> and also, I don't think so, that you, you you can assume that efficiency is going to be very interesting to that student to necessarily. That, time, that right? is, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I I, it, I do lose some attention by switching back and forth, but that's how so I like I, to read. You know, I, right. I that's that's my style. Well, and sometimes <laughs> it's it's that little umph to get you back into it. I mean, you can sit and look at a book for seven hours and get nothing out of it or whatever. Yeah. Um, and if you take those little breaks, Susan Susan Kane in Quiet um, calls them restorative niches. I mean, she she talks about them in different ways, but I see that as mm -hmm. when you when you take your attention intentionally someplace else. It could be that you're seeking a restorative niche so that you can come back to the task at hand because maybe it wasn't your choice to begin with, or maybe it was. And again, that's just like you said, Fred. That's how our minds work. Mm -hmm. So, attention is about awareness. We want kids to be more aware of where their attention is. Is or is there something we need to teach them? Well, I, I see it that way, but I one of the things we really are focusing on is, you know, we have the notice, dream, connect, do. The notice came from, it got clinched. It was like, we have to have this in here after um, we had read Ellen Langer's book called Mindfulness. And um, she talks about how when you have set outcomes and when you go through, when you have routine, you become mindless. And so when you're, when you're living each day mindful, um, you will have intentional distractions or intentional attentions, you know, whatever you want to call them. But we really have become quite mindless because of the compulsion and the routine that we go through in the course of the day. Even the fact that you go in, in school, you go into the room that looks the same every day. That, in, uh, you know, according to a lot of people's research, but Ellen Langer's, um, that, that creates a mindlessness when you go into that same space, you know, and sometimes that could be helpful if you want to think less about that and you want that to be automated. But I would think in a school, you want to be in perpetual learning mode, you know, <laughs> noticing mode, mm -hmm. well, a lot of the time anyway. Yeah, tra training in noticing is, a, is an interesting concept. I mean, how exactly do you what what are the exercises <laughs> that that students need to do to to learn how to notice things I I more consciously and not just be receptive to it 
to whatever is trying to grab their attention. They need to be around adults who haven't been handed a curriculum that they have to do this way or, you know. Everybody can't come to you, Monica. <laughs> Oh, I, yeah. we all have it. We all have it in us. We, it's our... <laughs> so watch, what... watch, I get it. Watch Dave Cormier. Watch his um, ed tech talks. Um, he has a video out about rhizomatic learning. And you, you become addicted to perpetual beta. And... Um, Mary Catherine Bateson, who wrote um, Peripheral, Peripheral Visions, um, she's Margaret Mead's daughter, talks about being in the vulnerability of context. And you become addicted to it. It's like, I don't know why we ever got away from it. I, I know it's because we wanted to manage things and we were getting ready for this industrial society and it was very efficient. But man, it's like, we get to be a five-year-old again, and we get to just be curious, you know. I so, want to piggyback on that. But my my um partner that I'm working with, she, I was like, you know, what we're doing is it's it's I I think I use the word non-traditional, and she she was like, no, I have to correct you. It is not non-traditional. Actually, what we're doing with education now is non-traditional because if you go back and you look at how people have educated children over the years, what we're doing now is not what's considered traditional. Tradi homeschooling and letting kids experience and learn by apprenticeship that was tradition, and what we're doing now is a, a departure from that. And there, there is a very long tradition that goes back to the 40s of progressive education that, that uh, you know, Dewey was an advocate of. There's this right. wonderful video I used in a presentation recently that's a movie tone newsreel from the 1940s about how uh, project-based learning was sweeping the country and this new way of student-directed, interest-driven, experiential learning was the way that all schools were going to be now. From now on, everybody got the message. It's, it's quite amazing to think that we, we almost had it there. <laughs> and it's really a, 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 uh, the corporate behemoth that took it away. But I, I have to, to jump in and say, I, I don't think that we're talking about two things that go together automatically. Um, I, I, I think that, that play is incredible and very important. I think that project-based learning is very important. I think that getting kids excited about things because they get to choose is critical. Um, but that may cause them to want to pay more attention but I don't think that's the same as learning to be mindful and, and to make choices. Um, and, and I think what I was thinking about before we sort of turned that direction is about cognition and metacognition. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how you teach it. I think that I think a lot about conversations I have and um, things that go on around me because I studied sociology as an undergrad. And, and that's a lot about looking at what's happening around you. And, and I think that's a lot of what I took from the, the chapter on attention is that it's that mindfulness of thinking about what's going on and making decisions based on that. And I think that one of the ways that kids learn that is modeling and appropriate questions where a teacher's not saying why are you doing that but more of a why did you know can you tell me how you made the decision to do that so you're not questioning mm -hmm. what they're doing but how they got there so that they think about it mm -hmm. and i think it's it's a hard thing to do not all adults have great metacognition either mm -hmm. because we haven't learned it one of the things we really think will change things is if um, rather than standardized tests, we, we push self-assessments um, and talking to yourself, just the importance of talking to yourself every day. 
and saying just the things that you just said, you know, um, I just, I just did this, this, why did I do this? Did it matter? You know, and, and how did it happen? Um, but yeah, I, I, and you, you first said, how do we teach that? And then you said, we do it by looking and by modeling. And so also we're wondering if you even teach, is it a myth that, that we learn from teaching, mm. you know? Well, that brings up the, the whole topic of, of curation, which uh, I, I'm sure um, Howard at least mentions in this book, but it, it's, mm -hmm. the, uh, it's a crucial part of the Mind Amplifiers course and, and the notion that we are all essentially now curating a digital presence okay. for ourselves that, that is perpetual and that we have to be conscious about and I see that as the, the wedge that we can use to try to inject some person-directed learning into the public school system in the sense that a personally curated uh, portfolio that a student owns, that they begin as early as they have access to a digital network, and that they curate for themselves becomes their assessment that anybody can go and look at and, and see how they're doing and whatever you want to create for the, 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 the uh, how, how you look at those pieces to say, see that the, the, the student has met whatever expectations you have for that stage of learning that's just so much more uh, an interesting way to think about the whole process of education than any of these assessments that we're using now. And perhaps even more interesting, when I looked up the word curate, it said taking care of souls. So what if we again follow Dave Cormier and um, in his last video he said we need to stop measuring learning, you know. Um, so what if we're not even doing that? What if we don't spend all of our time trying to prove ourselves and we're just talking to ourselves more and, and wondering if it matters and and people are freed up a lot more time to be doing and talking and so I love that. Curate means take care of souls. Curare. <laughs> all right. So, how are we going to talk to Howard next week? <laughs> we're going to be in, we're going to be in the vulnerability of the context. We're just going to jump in and see what happens. Sure. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, Paul, everybody, you haven't, been watching Dave. you haven't been watching Dave's talks. I have. I have. Okay. Honestly, never mind. We'll talk another time. Yeah. I feel like he. Yeah, I feel like we've been. I feel like he's a, he's like in a secondary, like he's in a college situation, and the stuff he's talking about we've been doing for years, and I'm glad he's finally discovering it. But anyway, <laughs> that's, so you know, I I don't kind of get it sometimes, but um, he can. He anyway. I th think I think we should all like try to find our most outrageous pair of shoes. And then at some given signal from Paul, we'll all flash Flashing. outrageous shoes at him. Or we could all buy, um, you know, like a bald head. Beanie hats. Head. <laughs> Skull caps. <laughs> when he comes on, That's we're true. all bald. Is that okay. what you were looking for, Paul? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> See if we can grab his attention. I... See if he can... <laughs> I honestly want to take his making the syllabus available to us, um, and and uh, I want to take that and give it some credibility in some way, and try to say that I can't imagine bringing that curriculum into a lot of high schools, like it doesn't fit, but. But thinking about it in in other ways is is important. So I think there's a lot of important things in the curriculum, 
and and trying to have that conversation with him would be good i think but so paul do you want to focus more on the syllabus than the book next week i think they go together um so but yeah we could do that <laughs> i just was curious just in terms of thinking a little bit yeah, ahead of right so that we can all sound good and make you look good. <laughs> make you look good. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I'll sh I'll send him an email and see what he thinks about that. But yeah, look at the and we'll send you some notes about it. Um, to that effect, that you know, check this syllabus out. I think it's a wonderful syllabus. I just can't imagine teaching it, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Yeah, you know, I don't know what to do with that notion. Um, you don't see it being a nine a nine week high school course or an eighteen week high school course, <laughs> huh? Well, say what you mean by that. Yeah, I, I, exactly. I mean, but, yeah. Again, I can I can see dismantling it and sticking because there really are components of it that I'm willing to fold into my classroom today. There really mm -hmm. are. Um, and some of it we, we already do, it's just that we don't give it the name crap detection or whatever or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I was overjoyed when I saw it. I really was. Because to me, it's, um, it's like taking, <coughs> I fell in love with you, with the Youth Voices Google Doc check-in thing, mm -hmm. where you do your current events, you do your reading, you do your whatever. So that's how I really fell in love with Youth Voices was the fact that they had some sort of document that would help a kid and a teacher track some of their online presence and some of the things they should do. Well, then for me to then see his syllabus, you know, mm -hmm. it's, 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 there are parts of it that I can easily take and plug into my class. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't see myself teaching it for, you know, nine weeks or 18 weeks or whatever. But there are definitely components that will definitely enhance my English class. It's interesting. Yeah, you said that better than I did. So I should be <laughs> quiet. Uh, Monica, I, I, I'm sorry I don't remember his name, but I do recognize his face. Say hello. Christian. Christian hey, Christian. Right. Welcome. Hi, Christian. Christian. What's up? Hey. Nothing, just... Is he listening to you guys talk? He's he's working on that video that I told you I had to ditch, and so he's been. So I just <laughs> asked sorry. him, you know, I, I kind yeah. of briefly explained the book and said, you know, we are like going non-compulsory anything, but if you were going to be in a situation where th some things were compulsory, would you, do you, first of all, I asked him if he thought kids needed to know some of this stuff about how to figure out if something's crap or not, how to, how to figure out how to have intentional attention. And then I asked him if, how important, you know, put it in with the other curriculum stuff. Do you want to answer it or do you want to Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I'm just going to say what I thought. But, I mean, it'd be cool to learn, like, for people to learn about that and learn how to, uh, like, figure out what's, what could be true and figure out how to figure out what's true and what's not true or what, what's bogus and what's not bogus. But it's also like you, you let them free a little bit too to have them teach you also what's bogus and not, what's not bogus. So that, that'd be cool. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was a really good point. And, and I kept feeling that, that I learn as much from my students about attention and about crap detection, crap detection, um, as they learn from me. So that back and forth is really important. Coney twenty twelve, was that crap or was that uh, real? <laughs> you know, I mean, I it was real. That was real. <laughs> yeah. Here's here's a. Do we really want to go there, Paul? Because I do know. <laughs> no, but, yeah. Why not? I think that's an important, I think that I was, was an I important think, moment to, to think Here's about. Here's my take on that, yeah. and I could be completely yeah. wrong and bogus, so you got to decide if I'm crap or not, right? Um, yeah. So, and it has to do with Christian, so I'm going to share it, and it kind of ticked me off a little bit. 
So Can you put posters up? I, I believe that we are really. <laughs> We need to get away from being such cynics about things. No. Um, because there's a lot of good going on in the world, and we're spending too much time trying to figure out what is all bad, you know. And so that Coney 2012 comes out, and people are all zinged, and then shortly after, people are just ripping it apart. So Christian comes in, and um, it, some conversation came up, and um, he was telling me about now it's, you know, it's, I can't believe it's bogus or something like that. And see, he told me the specific part, and I said, well, no, that part's not, you know. And I, yeah. I showed him the history, I, you know, Warney, what's her first name? I don't remember. But some of the kids that have been involved in that, we had mm -hmm. invisible children come to our school. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, you know, I found this bit of, you know, somebody had their pop can held so that the, the words were out. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so anyway... This is what this but Monica, is what I don't, got me kind I, of riled right now. Hold on, hold on. I don't, this I don't know what you mean. No, I, I mean, because I don't want to take away from Fred's point there at all. I think that he has an important point. Um, but I totally agree with 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 the Coney twenty twelve. I wasn't being cynical about it. Um, and I think watching how students responded to it was was the most important thing to do. And so this is um, because this is their what riled response people. was complicated. Is, yeah. Let me what? tell you the pop can thing. So this is the mm -hmm. pop can thing. This is adults or whoever holding the pop can just so, so that Christian comes into me and says, now it's bogus. And I'm asking him right. why. It's because all these people have said it's bogus. And, and he just, it's an adult. So, oh, okay. And then I tell him the stuff that, no, it's not. And he goes, well, that's what I thought. And I'm like, why do we put kids in that? Why have we gotten them to this point where an adult raises an eyebrow and they, and they don't even believe, you know? So that's where he can, you know, we can teach each other the, you know, the crap detection part is. Here, but does that make my, sense? Yes, my my point in bringing it up and at the end, <laughs> um, is is that it's not crap or not crap. And many Hello. things aren't. Many things are very complicated. And if you if you right. read through this second chapter, you know his his description is complicated too. But I hate that title, and I hate teachers walking around thinking you know th some things are crap and some things right. aren't. You know that there's there's something kind of fishy about that. So I think I think we're kind of saying the same thing there, Paul. Yeah, we are. Believe yeah. it or not. Yeah. Believe it or not. I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> um, we should uh, get off here uh, and uh, see you all next week. Um, anybody want to throw something in at the end here, though? Please feel free. Or if you want to say goodnight, you can. I just to say, I was kind Please of, say, with the whole Coney thing, I think yeah. the thing that was scary to me is that, to me, Coney was sexy. You know, the kids, a lot of my students really attached to it because it was cool and it was well presented and not that they were necessarily interested in anything in depth like what are they going to do but it's just like wow this is something for us to believe or follow and I guess that really goes to show that we really have to start infusing more things that kids can feel like they have a purpose because I feel like that's why Coney captured so many students because it gave them something to rally around when they don't really have that. Good point. The other point I'd like to feel right now is that as soon as we talk about specifics um, as soon as the stuff that Reingold's talking about in his book get attached to content, um, it gets really, really interesting. So I, I wonder if we can, you know, kind of think about doing that next week with him too. So, um, yeah, so thank you all. <laughs> um, my favorite person in the world is Dave Cormier. <laughs> Um, because he made all this happen, and um, and Jeff Lebo at edtechtalk.com and worldbridges.net. Thank you all, and um, we'll see you here next week. Good night. Thank you. Thanks again. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>